When we put the MFA program together in 97, we were really dedicating ourselves to this notion of independent filmmaking. They are giving up their summer or spring or winter break to go do something. It's very exciting because the community college model that is being unveiled today is really a reform engine. Students were to think about Staten Island and decide what images of Staten Island would represent their perspective. Thankfully, I've had no hecklers. They don't really bother me a lot. Um, I don't know who would want to bother a harpist. Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. This 35-acre neo-Gothic campus is home to the venerable City College, the oldest of CUNY's 24 institutions. It's also home to one of the most prestigious film programs anywhere in the world, with a history spanning over 70 years. Today on Study with the Best, we're going to learn more about that program, and we're going to get an insider's look at the City Visions Film Festival. program itself is relatively young. We started in 1997. One little known fact about City College and filmmaking is that we are one of the oldest film institutes in the country. In the early 40s, Hans Richter, the uh, expat avant-garde filmmaker, came to New York uh, being driven out of Europe by the Nazis. The United States needed filmmaking to kind of counter the triumph of the will level propaganda that was coming out on, on film in Europe. So he was hired by City College to direct the Institute of Film Techniques, which was really the first documentary film institute in, in the country at the college level, and is arguably one of the first film production schools in America. When we put the MFA program together, we were really dedicating ourselves to this notion of independent filmmaking in, in all of its aspects. And at that point, it bifurcated into independent documentary, independent fiction filmmaking. And to this day, we still are dedicated to that notion of new ideas coming from emerging populations, people drawing on their own unique cultural heritage to find stories within their communities that may not be Hollywood derived, so to speak, but come from the heart and, um, and soul of these writer-directors. That was our focus at the beginning. It remains our focus today, but I think that's what makes us unique by drawing from that independent tradition, but also co-equally emphasizing storytelling in documentary and fiction. Even though the program at City College is a year shorter than most MFA uh, programs, which is to say it's two years inst instead of three, we insist that there's an exit ritual gauntlet, whatever you want to call it. We have a very sophisticated film festival at the end of the two-year cycle where each director is required to get their thesis film up there in front of a New York audience of press, industry folks. Uh, we have traditionally done our City Visions Festival at the DGA Theater on West 57th Street, so it's a very visible location and has become somewhat of a magnet for the independent film community to come and see the work that our students do. Being located in Manhattan has allowed us to really draw from a rich uh, body of professionals. Peter Bogdanovich has worked through, Sigourney Weaver has been here, Al Mazels, the iconic documentary maker, has made several visits to our students and really loves working with them. But people have come and really continue to come back because they like the vibe of the program, they like the atmosphere that we create, and they love the students. 
one of the measures of, of the success of a, a program, although not the sole measure, is what happens with this work that the, the students do. As young as our program is and as small as our program is, we have an amazing track record of our students' films getting out there. And we as faculty always feel privileged to get the, the achievement level of the students that we get, but also this amazing diversity. You know, our student population is usually two-thirds international, and it's just a wonderful cauldron of ideas and different aesthetics and different cultural traditions that feed into the program. So I'm privileged to direct a program that has such a wonderful mix. Barry Mitchell. The energetic young man you're looking at is Lehman College student David Benito. The highlight of my trip in South Africa was being invited to partake in a tribal dance uh, by the Zulu tribe. I will never forget that moment. It was a life-changing moment for me. David is part of a group of student volunteers who recently had an eye-opening adventure thanks to a five-year-old campus-run community service program. Amanda Dubois is director of Lehman College's Community Engagement and New Student Programs. She coordinates Lehman Life. Leaders involved for everyone. The Lehman Life program basically gives students an opportunity to volunteer at home and get a sense of what the needs are in our own community, then take what they've learned to South Africa in this instance. Do you guys remember the Mandela House where he used to live? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is where he lived with Winnie. They are giving up their summer or spring or winter break to go do something that's other than partying or going on a, a spring break cruise or something like that. <laughs> students do have to fundraise 100% of their trip and the students help choose a location that they're gonna go and do community service. And our students traveled to South Africa. We got to Johannesburg and we volunteered for about five days there and then traveled to Cape Town. There's the kitchenette. <laughs> so this was where a kitchen, a kitchen at Nikosi's. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the kitchen at Nikosi's Haven. Nikosi's Haven in Johannesburg is a residential community for mothers with HIV and their children. We volunteer there, and amongst our duties, we helped out in the kitchen and supervised nursery school children, along with teenagers and their tutoring. The thing with going to Nicosi's Haven was that we weren't aware. They didn't tell us who was HIV positive and who was not. I personally, I did not care. I got my master's in secondary English education um, here at Lehman. I chose South Africa mainly because I wanted to work with um, children and younger kids. Um, I work with a lot of teenagers at home and here I get to experience what it's like to work with the smaller ones. The most memorable student I worked with um, was Sean. Oh, there's Sean! Oh. Isn't that Sean? Yes. Yeah. And he's this little boy um, that's just absolutely adorable. I, I had to work a little bit to have him trust me, and he did. In Cape Town, Daniel Locke helped catalog and preserve artifacts of political protest from the apartheid era. We were able to visit the Mayu Bouye archives. We were able to work in the library and also in where they have the posters and banners of during apartheid, um, which is, you know, the word that South Africans use for discrimination and segregation. And we actually were the last set of people to actually touch those documents that are going to be, you know, you know, presented later on. Oh, there's Linda. Linda was the gentleman that we were talking about. He was the one that started the Alexandra Center for the Aged. Twala. That's right, Linda Twala. This used to be my home where you're standing. Uh, because of my political involvement in 1986, it was bombed by police. Most of the educational moments would come during those discussions after hours. Like, we can't believe that that gentleman said that. I remember saying uh, to my colleagues and to my peers, Wow, I am now in Africa. This is the African feeling that I was searching for. Join Lehman Life. See the world. Woo!
Who wrote that? <laughs> Barry Mitchell, study with the best. Great moments in CUNY history. He was the little man who did big things for our city. Fiorello H. LaGuardia, the reform-minded mayor of New York in the 1930s and 40s. And LaGuardia's private papers, photos, and even his World War I gas mask became the foundation of what is now the LaGuardia and Wagner Archives, housed at LaGuardia Community College in Long Island City. Each year, more than 2,000 students use the archives, a researcher's treasure trove of memorabilia and artifacts of New York City government. Even neighboring Steinway & Sons Piano Factory trusted LaGuardia Community College with its collection. Eventually, another New York City mayor wanted in. Former Mayor Robert F. Wagner donated his personal papers, thus creating the expanded LaGuardia Wagner Archives, ever evolving with a searchable online database, YouTube channel, and even its own smartphone app. The word convocation isn't something that you hear every day, but here at CUNY it means the beginning of a new school year, and today is a very special day for CUNY's newest community college and the students who make up its inaugural class. More than 300 students make up the inaugural class at the new community college. They gathered with CUNY's most senior administrators at the New York Public Library to celebrate the first opening of a city university community college in over 40 years. It's very exciting because the community college model that is being unveiled today is really a reform engine. It's an engine that was uh, built by Chancellor Goldstein and his staff working with all of the other six community colleges to create an institution that would put a great deal of focus on helping students to graduate in a much earlier time frame to move into the workforce and to be able to benefit from a community college education. CUNY's Chancellor Matthew Goldstein created the vision for the new community college. With the support of Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the Chancellor was able to get to work. It, it took several years to do it. The idea was to take uncertainty out of the system. But I brought the idea back, which was just in its nascent stage of development, and then got people who really understand uh, what I was trying to do and then reshaped it in ways that I would never be able to do. And making that vision become a reality meant a lot of legwork. Built the plan, found a facility, you know, did all of the things from scratch because there was nothing there. One of the school's main goals is to help students graduate on time. To make that happen, the school's founders have created an environment they feel more closely resembles a close-knit community rather than a school. They will not be attending the new community college as a solitary experience. They'll be doing it together with other students in the same classes. They'll receive academic advisement and mentoring a lot of emphasis on mentoring, uh, career placement and career help, internships, and a lot of support. Eddie Duray is currently a graduate student at Baruch College and employed as a lead peer mentor working with the college's inaugural group of students. During our admissions recruiting season, the peer mentors really get involved. They really have to meet with the students on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and that's where we get to share our own personal backgrounds. That's when we get to connect with them and forge that bond. Since the campus is close to major employers like AT&T and HBO, internships and job offers are only a short walk away. That combination seems to make it an easy sell to students. Um, I had been following it for two years, since sophomore year, so it was something that my college counselor and I had been looking on for quite a while, and the more we had read about it, the more interesting and more attractive it became, so it was, an, it was a no-brainer. If you think you might want to study at the new community college, you can find more information online. Their website is ncc.cuny.edu. I'm Andrew Falzone for Study with the Best. There's more on the way, but first, this message from the Chancellor. Hi, I'm Matthew Goldstein, presenting CUNY's 2012 Science All-Star Team, each winning a $126,000 National Science Foundation Award. From Baruch College, Belen Siguera Carrillo. From City College, Deborah Ayene. 
Teresa Carranza Fulmer, Charlie Corridor, Jamila Kester, Christy Sakdeo, and Zvi Fishman. From the CUNY Graduate Center, Andrew Fulmer. From Hunter College, Carolina Salguero, Jimena Santillan. From the Macaulay Honors College at City College, Jay Song Han, Christopher Hugh, and Stephen Ma. And the Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College, Vivian Baldessari and Vincent Way. And from York College, Kirk Haltofterheide. CUNY Science All-Stars, like our Yankees, hometown champions. Yeah, I mean, most people just walk by and be like, it's fairy, who cares? And I was like, wait, that fits perfect. This can work, I like this. My idea was, was how can I incorporate the most iconic symbol of Staten Island without being cliche? That right there, I, I see is Staten Island. It's, it's the ferry, it's, and plus, you know, and plus too, I took the picture in such a, an abstract way where it reveals itself just enough without, without really shouting out what it is. I was thinking automatically of the blue on the bottom and the orange on top and take a picture of it. But when I went to actually take a picture, I didn't even realize, oh wait, I, I, the window can fit in there as well. Mm. And that kind of all just happened when I was there. One of our challenges is to collect images of Staten Island. People are taking uh, digital photography, uh, they're not necessarily uh, creating some permanent record. So I got this idea for the, a way we could engage those students with the archives and also help build our photograph collection by having a photograph contest. Uh, As I See It is the name of the contest and students were to think about Staten Island and decide what images of Staten Island would represent their perspective on this borough. I could tell that the people who entered the contest really thought about what is distinctive about Staten Island and, so, and as a result I think we got really great images to add to our collection. One thing I noticed uh, as a kind of theme in the photographs is that the students weren't really taking images of current construction. They were taking photographs of disappearing landscapes and marginal landscapes. So the students put together this great book of their images and entitled it A Floating World, obviously referencing Staten Island as an island. I mentioned that one of the photographers had taken these nighttime shots and thought those shots were particularly evocative of Staten Island. And as I was talking with her, my sense was that um, she was thinking in that way because so many Staten Islanders, of course, work off the island. And their experience of the island is often a nighttime Staten Island because that's when they're here. And uh, the shots that she took around this housing complex where she lives are clearly <laughs> very eerie. So my section I call um, On the Road to Nowhere. It's about um, these abandoned roads and um, infrastructures that were built on Staten Island. It all goes back to like when I was a lot younger, I was always just um, seduced by abandoned houses. And as I got old, I get a little more curious. I'm like, oh, what is this? What is that? And I would just keep investigating, investigating, going to like a journalist of just want to know more about stuff. It was color. The color would, would, would take away from it and the picture would be more about, you pay more attention to the, the saturation of the colors as opposed to the, what's actually composed in the picture itself. So it's less distracting as opposed to the, the cover itself of the ferry. It's all about the color. If that was taken in black and white, it would be meaningless. 
So in that sense, the color is the narrative here. It's really more that the subject matter is going to be the narrative of the picture. I think it was a very successful undertaking, and I'm really glad that the students had the experience of, of putting the, their images into a book. And, like their photographs, this book is going to get cataloged. It's going to get added to the archives. Each of the contributors will be listed as a co-author. And so once again, it's, it's this opportunity for the student to have the experience of contributing to a book and really making a significant contribution to our archives through this, through this class project. Once I was actually transporting my harp to a subway gig and I had the cover on and um, I was pushing it down the sidewalk and a little kid was with his mother and he stops and he just points at the harp and he's like, oh, it's like, mom, look at that, it's a giant chess piece. Hi. <laughs> my name is Emily Hopkins. I grew up in West Islip, Long Island. I'm a sophomore at Hunter College. I'm studying music performance. I'm part of the Hunter Symphony, which is run by Hunter. Even before I start playing, I'm unpacking. People stop to look and say, oh, what is that? And um, it really makes me feel good that, I'm, that I have this talent to do this because, and make their day a little better. of the subway is a difficult thing to deal with. It makes it difficult to stay in tune. Thankfully, I've had no hecklers. They don't really bother me a lot. Um, I don't know who would want to bother a harpist. I performed in Carnegie Hall in 2009 with the Metropolitan Youth Orchestra and that was a great experience but it is a lot different than playing in the subways. I would prefer playing in the subways because it's a lot more informal than actually going onto a stage, having complete silence and everyone listening to you play a certain repertoire. I've noticed that when I play Beatles songs, people tend to tip more because I love how Yesterday sounds on the harp, um, and I guess they do too. Music Under New York is a program that allows musicians to publicly perform in um, subway spaces legally. Because a lot of people perform and they're not really allowed to do that. That actually happened to me in November before I got the Muni permit. When I was eight years old, my family and I went out to eat. There was a harpist performing. So this was the first time I'd seen a harpist and I just stared at him the whole dinner. I instantly knew, I was like, I need to play that. When I was accepted into Hunter, I was offered the Muse Scholarship. My tuition and room and board is actually paid for, so I'm very lucky. I enjoy seeing little children come up and say, what is that, can I play the harp? And I would love to inspire someone to play the harp, and it doesn't really matter about making money, it's just about doing what I love to do. I've had people come up to me and say, is that the thing that angels play? And I was like, yeah. <laughs>
watching Study with the Best. For all things CUNY, log on to our website at cuny.edu, or you can Facebook and tweet us at CUNY TV. See you next time.